morning. It is such an honor to be with you all. This is a highlight of the year for me, one of the highlights of the year. This is such an exciting conference, and it's so great to see so many first-time attendees, so I want to welcome all of you, but I also want to welcome all of those people who I've seen over the years have been coming to this conference for a very long time now, and it's always great to see familiar faces. So thank you so much for being here, and thank you so much for having me. Before we get underway, I think I'd like to start with a prayer, because if we're talking about Jesus and we're not talking to Jesus, we've missed the entire point of an Applied Biblical Studies conference. Amen? Amen. So why don't we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come together as your family, and we ask you to pour out your grace upon us this morning, this afternoon, and throughout this conference. We ask you to help us come to a deeper love for you by studying your word in sacred scripture. We ask you to set our hearts on fire with the Holy Spirit, the same spirit who inspired the book of Philippians through the hand of Paul. We ask you, Lord, to help us become more like Christ in imitating Paul, who laid down his life as Christ gave himself for the church. And we ask you in particular to help us find ways to do that in, in the concrete, not only in the abstract. Help us, Lord, to be empowered, to be energized, to be enabled by what we study here to love you more deeply and by the gift of that same spirit who inspired this book to lay down our lives and offer it as a fragrant offering, as St. Paul describes in Philippians. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. St. Paul, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, I'd like to begin by looking at a section of Philippians chapter 1. I've been assigned Philippians chapter 1. And I'd like to look at a section in this chapter that really... Uh, D describes a key dilemma for St. Paul. Although when you read the section of Philippians 1, it doesn't appear that Paul is all that vexed, all that anxious. In the verses leading up to this section, Philippians 1, 19 through 25, and you all should have a handout. Did everyone get a copy of the handout? And before I forget, I should tell you that if you go by the verbum table over in the J.C. Williams Center, they've taken this handout and they've inserted it into Logos Bible Software, verbum software, and now all of the Bible verses and the catechism and the Greek text, all of these things are linked to various resources, and it makes it very easy to use on that software. So I do want to encourage you to check that out. But in the verses preceding this section, Paul talks about his imprisonment and his suffering. And so he says, yes, I shall rejoice. <laughs> and you read that and you, you almost feel like someone needs to let Paul in on the fact that he's supposed to be suffering. He's supposed to be in prison, facing hardship. And yet that's not the tone of this letter at all. Now, I got to tell you, this is surprising for me. It's difficult for me because I don't handle adversity well. I really don't. Life is full of all kinds of trials and challenges. Uh, now, oftentimes, they are blessings. In the last couple of weeks on June 8th, I guess not just a couple of weeks ago, but on June 8th, uh, my wife and I welcomed a new baby into the world. And it is, it is a time to rejoice. Amen. It's baby number five. Now everybody's not so excited for me, right? <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, and so uh, I've got to tell you, this letter where Paul is talking about rejoicing in suffering uh, is uh, particularly applicable in this time of my life. Childbirth is hard. It's painful. <laughs> Let me tell you, this is our fifth one and this is my wife's fifth C-section. And it's excruciating. I mean, I got to get up early in the morning, <laughs> drive her to the airport, I mean, drive her to the hospital, right? I got to wheel her bags in for her, and then we got to sit and fill out all this paperwork. She does all the paperwork. I just kind of stand by. But it is so boring. There's no internet connection. I can't do anything on my phone. I can't check my Facebook. <laughs> 
I just got to stand there and watch it all. And then we finally go into the room, and then that's where, you know, things really start to progress. And they give my wife an IV, and, and all sorts of medical procedures are performed on her. And it's really difficult to watch. <laughs> it goes on and on and on, you know. And they don't really have a place for me to sit, you know, so I just have to stand there. And then there's the operation itself. It's so uncomfortable. I have to wear all of this gear when I go in there. And then the baby comes, and that's great. It's exciting to hold the baby, but then it's really hard after that. I mean, I get very little sleep. <laughs> and worst of all, in the hospital that we go to, they don't have any Diet Coke. It's only Diet Pepsi. I mean, what are they thinking about? I don't handle adversity well. St. Paul is in prison, and he's rejoicing. And as I was excited and preparing for the birth of our child, I was reading through Philippians 1 in preparation for this weekend, and I was really struck by Paul's joy in the midst of all of these trials. He says, yes, and I shall rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. And the Greek word there is soteria. Now, that's the word we get, we often translate salvation. It's, in fact, just a few verses later, uh, in the next paragraph, we have that word and it's translated salvation. So, what is Paul talking about? Is he talking about his desire to be delivered from prison? Yes, I, I'm confident that I will be delivered out of prison. Or is it something more? Is Paul confident in his friends' prayers in that they will lead to not just his deliverance from prison, but from a greater kind of deliverance? I think we could read it at both levels with, uh, with profit. He says, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I, shall not at all, that I should not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. So note, Paul isn't necessarily saying that in order for Christ to be glorified in order for him to rejoice he has to be delivered from prison no there's another sort of salvation that he's also equally if not more actually more concerned about in verse 21 he says and this is one of my favorite lines in the whole epistle for to me live for to me to live is christ and to die is gain if it is to be life in the flesh that means fruitful labor. In Greek, it's karpos ergu, for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. And just a sideline, by the way, uh, non-Catholic Christians and Jehovah Witnesses will sometimes tell you that there is no life after death, but after death we go into a kind of soul sleep. Anybody ever hear that before? Yeah. Well, some people actually think that that's what Paul teaches in the New Testament, but those people clearly haven't read Philippians because Paul believes that if he dies, he will go and be with Christ. And he says, for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Now, this is a very rich passage. There's so much we could say about it. The first thing I'd like to highlight, though, is the way Paul's teaching certainly reflects that of his Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's language of rejoicing and suffering is recognized by many scholars as an allusion to Jesus' teaching in the Gospels, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5.11, Jesus says, Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice. Cairo, it's the same word that Paul uses. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. Here's St. Paul 
is in prison and he is mindful of the teaching of Jesus that when we are persecuted, we should rejoice because it, it is in that persecution that we are being conformed to the image of our Lord. Now, it's easy to know that. It's another thing to put it in practice. I remember when I first really caught fire for my faith. I was in junior high and I went to a Catholic school and in this Catholic school, uh, there, were, there was, in the back of our classroom, a kind of coat closet. And uh, students could hang up different posters, things that they liked, on the inside of the closet. So when you closed the doors, you wouldn't see them. Well, one of the students brought in a poster from this rock band that had an image of Jesus Christ on the cross being devoured by a satanic dragon. And the teacher permitted him to hang it on the closet in the back of the classroom. Now, I was just a little kid, and I was getting excited about my faith. And so filled with righteous indignation, all right, I decided to use my opportunity for a class presentation <laughs> to call out the student for posting this thing in the back of the classroom. And I spoke with all kinds of zealous fervor. After I was done, I, I understood that he was not very happy with me. And uh, so I was about to go home, and one of our mutual friends came over to me and said, okay, this guy, he's really upset with you, and he and a bunch of his other friends are going to jump you on your way home. And so I thought to myself, well, this is horrible. Why? And so I decided to take the long way home, around the backside of the school to get home. And when I got home, I was so sad because I thought to myself, well, there I go. You know, I'm giving this great talk on how, you know, we need to be firm in the gospel and how we need to embrace Jesus. But when the rubber hits the road, what do I do? I take the back way home, you know? And I was devastated. And uh, my uncle, who was a priest, called me up and, and, uh, and told me that it was probably a good idea for me to avoid getting beat up. But oftentimes we realize that when, you know, things heat up, we oftentimes flee. Yet Jesus teaches us that it is in those times that we're being persecuted, that we're suffering for our faith, that we should rejoice. I thought it might be appropriate to talk about this topic, given the way our country is going, all right? Because it seems like persecution is on the horizon in many places, right? And we need to follow the example of St. Paul here in rejoicing and suffering. But I'd like to even hone in a little bit more on Paul's language and try to unpack what it is he's, he's saying. Because there's a deeper element of Paul's teaching that relates to Jesus' teaching that we might often miss. In fact, I've missed for most of my life. Let me hone in on this phrase in verse 21. For to me, live is Christ, and die is gain. Now, the Greek word there is fascinating. The Greek word there is kerdos. And it actually is the word that means profit. Like you make you know, a financial profit. In fact, it's a term that Paul uses in another place in Philippians. This term is really on his mind. He says, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as refuse, scubula in the, in the Greek. It's a term that doesn't just mean trash. It can mean like excrement. It's the stuff you put in the sewer, the stuff you would, you know, Flush down the toilet. For Paul, he says everything that he's gained, and in context, he's talking about his righteousness according to the law and his status as a, a Pharisee. All of this, he says, he counts as refuse. Why? In order that I might gain, there's that word again, cardeno, it's the verbal form, that I might gain Christ. Paul speaks of salvation here in economic terms. That, uh, the uh, the um, BDAG, a very well-known uh, lexicon, dictionary of the Greek language, explains that keridos means, quote, that which is gained or earned 
a gain profit, something like that. Now, a lot of non-Catholic Christians will accuse Catholics of talking about earning their salvation. Anybody ever hear that kind of criticism before? Right? Well, we shouldn't talk about how we earn our salvation. That would be contrary to Paul. Well, actually, no, Paul actually uses that language. He uses the language of earning, of profit, to describe salvation in Philippians. The term is used in Titus 1.11, where Paul is talking about the false teachers. He explains that they're upsetting whole families by doing what? By teaching for base gain. They're making a profit on their false teaching. Now, it's fascinating. This is the same kind of language Jesus uses when he talks about rejoicing in suffering in Matthew 5. I already read the passage, but look right above on the handout one more time. Verse 12, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. Now, the Greek word there is mystos. And the English translation, which most English translations kind of reached their stable form a long time ago, sort of obscures that economic imagery, that language of earning, right? Because when you hear reward, you don't think of like your wage, your payment. When we hear the word reward today, we think of something that someone might give us if we find their lost dog. If we do something above and beyond the call of duty. But if you go back and look at the way that, we, that term reward has been used in the English language at the time when the Revised Standard Version and other editions of the Bible were finalized, that term was synonymous with wage. It's very interesting. I'm, I'm going to draw here from the work of a friend of mine named Nathan Eubank who is also uh, drawing on uh, work done by a professor at Notre Dame named Gary Anderson. Nathan Eubank has also uh, written up some of his work. This is in his dissertation, but he also summarized it in a fantastic article in the Letter and Spirit Journal that's published by the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. If you want to look it up, Volume 9 has a great little summary of his work. It's a fantastic article. And one of the things he points out is that that word that Jesus uses here, reward, your reward will be great in heaven, mystos, it's actually the term that elsewhere is used in Matthew in terms of a wage. For example, in Matthew 20, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a, a man who owns a field and he pays workers at the end of a long day of, of working in the field. And we read in Matthew 28, and when evening came, the owner of the vineyard, who's the image of God, said to his steward, call the laborers and pay, apodidomi, their wages. Pay them their wages. And the Greek word there is mystos, that same word Jesus uses in Matthew 5. Apodidomi, it's a term that's often used for paying someone for remuneration of labor and also mystos. It's a term that's used for wages. This is the language Jesus uses in the Sermon on the Mount when he's talking about salvation and when he's talking about what believers can expect as a result of their fidelity. Now, this economic language is certainly not the central image of the Christian faith. Certainly, the central image of the Christian faith is the Trinity. And at the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, I would submit, is the image of imagery of God's fatherhood, which appears 17 times there in Matthew's gospel, right? So the, certainly this is not the overarching concern. Our father is the way the Lord's prayer begins. But this economic language is not inconsequential to understanding Jesus's teaching because the our father goes on to include the petition, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Here, Jesus is describing sin as a debt. So if you get payment for good deeds, then what do you get as a result of sin? You accrue debt. You incur debt, I should say. This is the language of Second Temple Judaism. It's the language of the Old Testament. For example, in Proverbs 19.17, 
we read, he who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and the Lord will repay him for his deed. So if you do a good deed, in particular almsgiving, it's prominent in this uh, sort of complex in the Old Testament and Second Temple Judaism, when you give to others, what happens? Well, then you earn sort of credit from God. When you do a good deed, that counts towards, if you will, your heavenly bank account. <laughs> in fact, you can see this in the book of Sirach. Whoever honors his father atones for sins. And whoever glorifies his mother is like one who lays up treasure. And the language there of laying up treasure, it's the language of storing up, of saving away. For kindness to a father will not be forgotten, and against your sins it will be credited to you. It will be remembered in your favor as frost in fair weather. Your sins will melt away. So do good, do good, give to the poor, and what will happen? You will lay up treasure. You will shore up your credit account. It's not your earthly bank account, but the imagery implies that there's some sort of heavenly accounting. And this is the language that Jesus uses in the Gospels. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, Do not store up the, uh, the for yourself treasures in heaven. That Greek word there, store up. It's like in the English, it's lay up in the RSV. I've changed the translation here a little bit to help it reflect the meaning a bit better. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, riches on earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. Here's that idea of that heavenly account. Jesus also uses similar language in Matthew 6, and he particularly, in particular, he ties it to almsgiving. Beware of practicing your piety before men in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward, no mistos, no payment, no wage from your Father who is in heaven. Thus when you give alms, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by men. Truly I say to you, they have received their mistos, their payment. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will apodidomy you. He will pay you. He will give you remuneration for your work. In fact, the language is also found in Matthew 16. Jesus talks about the second coming, and he says, The Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. And then he will repay, apodidomy, every man for what he has done. At least there, the RSV uses the language of repayment. Now turn the page on your handout. I've been talking a lot about Jesus' teaching, and you might be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, isn't this a, a conference on Paul? Well, yes, it is, in particular Philippians. But I just want to highlight the fact that Paul uses this language as well. The same kind of language Jesus is, Jesus is using in the Sermon on the Mount is found in Paul's writing, Romans 2. You are storing up, they saridzes, wrath for yourself. You're not storing up treasure, you're storing up wrath for yourself. On the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed, for he will render, apodidomy, to every man according to his works. The same term that's used in Matthew 16 that's translated in the RSV, he will repay each man according to his works. Likewise, Paul describes Christ's work of redemption in economic terms. And by the way, that shouldn't be surprising. The term redeem is an economic term. Oftentimes, the term is used to buy someone out of their, their debt, out of, for example, debt prison. In the, old, in the ancient world, people didn't go to prison for, you know, 10 years or more. They went to prison if they owed a debt and they were forced to f find some way to repay it. 
oftentimes someone would have to pay the fee and get them out of prison. Well, St. Paul explains that we are in debt, that we owe a debt that we cannot pay. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses in Colossians 2. He goes on to say, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. That's the English Standard Version. What does Christ's death do? God has canceled the record, record of our debt. And perhaps everybody here is familiar with Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. So St. Paul uses this language as well. Now, before I go any further, I've got to be really clear. Some people are going to hear this talk and say, this is what I've always suspected. Catholics are Pelagians. They do believe that they earn their salvation. They don't believe in grace after all. Now, it was a lot of fun for me, Dr. Hahn mentioned this, but I got to contribute to this book, The Role of Works at the Final Judgment. Four views on the role of works at the Final Judgment. And the other contributors included Tom Schreiner, who's a, a well-known Protestant Reformed uh, exegete, and James D.G. Dunn, another very well-known uh, New Testament scholar. Uh, American New Testament scholar. And one of the things I got to do in the book was sort of lay out a Catholic understanding of salvation, but I wanted to do it in a way that would you know, maybe reveal the fact that the Catholic Church can shed a lot of light on passages that really are uncomfortable, right, for non-Catholic positions. So for those who believe that we're saved by faith alone and that our works play no role in our Salvation, that our works themselves do not uh, have that, that they don't have an instrumental role in our salvation, that they are not meritorious in any way. For those people, I wanted to highlight passages that are sort of problematic, right? Now, last year, Brant Petrie talked about, uh, I think it was last year, maybe it was the year before, he gave an overview of Catholic soteriology. And I don't want to rehash that whole, that whole issue. But let me just be really clear that in Matthew's gospel, it's very clear that, yes, disciples will do good works that will count towards their salvation, that will be rewarded. But that's only because of the work of Christ. The first thing Jesus says in the whole gospel of Matthew, that would be a big deal, right? I mean, what, what are his first words? What is the first thing Jesus says in the gospel of Matthew? John the Baptist sees him in the river Jordan. He says, this is not right. I shouldn't baptize you. Jesus says to him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Now, in his work, Nathan Eubank shows that the imagery here likely relates to that idea of a sort of heavenly bank account, right? And what Jesus is doing is showing us that his work especially in being baptized, which is a symbol of his death, his work is fulfilling all righteousness. And throughout the gospel, we recognize that believers are in union with Christ. So in Matthew 25, 40, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, as you did it for, the least, for, for one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Believers are brothers of Christ. And whatever... The, you do for a believer, you do for Christ, because Christ is united to believers. Jesus says, he who hears you, I'm sorry, he who receives you, receives me. So it's very clear in the Gospel of Matthew, if you read it carefully, that there isn't a competitive account between what Jesus does and what believers do. Because Christ is present in the believer. The only reason that we can do works that are meritorious, that earn a reward, is because in Matthew's gospel, Christ has fulfilled all righteousness. He's fulfilled that heavenly bank account. And now we can be united with him and participate in his mission. And this was made especially clear to St. Paul. So now we're going to transition and show how this same imagery is now found in St. Paul. So when St. Paul is on the road to Damascus, he is struck. He encounters Christ. 
and he hears a voice, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he says, who is it, Lord? Who are you, Lord, that I'm persecuting you? And he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And Saul could say, now, wait a minute, I'm not persecuting you. I'm just persecuting those lazy Christians. Wait a minute. You mean by persecuting them? And here is, as Sai Yun Kim and other New Testament scholars show, here is really the origin of St. Paul's mystical body ecclesiology, of his view of the church as the body of Christ. Christ is now living in the church and living in believers. And so St. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And likewise, in Philippians, now returning to the book we're looking at here, in Philippians chapter 2, St. Paul says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for God is at work, energeo. He's energizing. He's at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So what is salvation for St. Paul? Salvation is not a spectator sport. Salvation is not something that Christ does, and he says, all right, now you guys go sit in the bleachers and root me on. No, Christ invites us out onto the field. Christ is now working in us. Is Paul a Pelagian? Does he believe that we work out our salvation and we earn our salvation apart from grace? Of course not. Why is it possible that we can be saved? It is only because of the grace of Christ, right? Now, to be clear, this informs St. Paul's vision of his persecution. And now I'd like to return to Philippians 1. St. Paul says in Philippians 1.3, I thank my God, and the Greek word there is eucharisteo, in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy, thankful for your partnership, for your koinonia in the gospel. That word partnership could be translated communion. In the gospel, from the first day until now. Notice for Paul, salvation is not just about him and Jesus. Christ is united to all believers. All believers are in this together. There's a koinonia, a communion here. A participation together in the work of Christ. And I am sure that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Why is St. Paul so sure of this? St. Paul says, I'm sure that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. What gives St. Paul this kind of confidence? Well, St. Paul believes once you're saved, you're always saved. No, I don't think so. Eternal security is a doctrine that many non-Catholics believe in, that once you're saved, you can't lose your salvation. But that is not what St. Paul says. For example, in 1 Corinthians 9, St. Paul talks about how he pummels his body lest he himself be disqualified from the race. He knows that he himself uh, is not necessarily assured of his own salvation. All right, that it is possible to lose one's salvation. So why is Paul so confident that the good work that is begun in believers will be brought to completion? Well, let's look at that. He says, it is right for me to feel thus about you, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers, soon koinonus, with me, koinonia, that same word, communion, with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense, apologia, that's where we get the word apologetics, and confirmation of the gospel. He explains that the Philippians are partakers with him of grace in his imprisonment. Now, how is Paul's imprisonment an opportunity of grace for the Philippians? That's a good question, right? How is Paul being in prison an opportunity of grace? Well, you might say it's because it gives the Philippians greater confidence to proclaim the the message of the gospel. But there's more to it, I think, than just that. There's so many things I'd like to say about this section, but I'm going to have to move quickly here. In this section, we have many allusions to the Eucharist, I think. I thank my God. There's that word Eucharist. And then Paul talks about 
communion in Christ. It sounds a lot like what Paul says about the Eucharist in 1 Corinthians 10. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation, koinonia, in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake koinonia of the one bread. In fact, you can see Paul's emphasis on unity, on the partnership in the gospel, and communion in the gospel right from the outset of the epistle, where Paul talks about his co-workers, something that's very unusual in Greco-Roman epistles. One scholar looked at 645 examples of papyrus letters, and only six of all those letters do we have examples of a letter writer mentioning his co-workers, other people who are writing with him. St. Paul has a uniquely ecclesial outlook here, right? at least in the ancient world. St. Paul has a unique uh, approach to writing letters where he emphasizes those with him. Why, I think Anthony Thistleton says it best. He says, Paul does not perceive himself as commissioned to lead or to minister as an isolated individual. Why? Well, we are all united in Christ, and that union in Christ is especially for St. Paul related to or affected, we could say, by our Eucharistic participation. St. Paul goes on to say, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that I may hear of you, that you stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear omen to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict, which you saw and now hear to be mine. St. Paul talks about how the Philippians are sharing in his suffering. Now, of course, we could talk about redemptive suffering here. And Matt Leonard is going to relate that in a talk in a workshop later on. St. Paul believes that all of us as one body are united in Christ. And so our sufferings redound when they're united to Christ to the benefit of the whole body. We see that in Colossians 1.24. If you look at on, the, on page 3 in the last page of the handout, the second Bible verse. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. But there's a very concrete way Paul sees the Philippians participating in his suffering. There's a very clear way St. Paul tells the Philippians they can share in his ministry. And they can express their union with Christ. Earlier, I mentioned the economic language that Paul uses. To, to die is gain. And he also talks about his fruitful labor. Now that language of fruitful labor, karpos in Greek, it can be understood in terms of a crop, but it also can have the, the meaning of a yield, an advantage, a gain, or profit. I've laid that out there on the handout. Paul describes his ministry in terms of fruitful labor, a fruitful harvest. Philippians 1.9, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruits of righteousness, which come through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That's Philippians 1. Paul's ministry is a ministry that involves a harvest of righteousness, as he says later on in 2 Corinthians. But there's a very concrete way Paul talks about that ministry, that fruitful labor. He goes on to talk at the end of Philippians about, guess what? Almsgiving. Remember, if on the one side salvation is understood in terms of gaining a profit, the flip side of that is recognizing that in order to enter into that heavenly profit, in order to receive that heavenly profit, we have to renounce earthly profit. We have to renounce earthly goods. And so St. Paul describes how it is that the Philippians share in his ministry. Now, I've got to tell you, 
It's only been recently how much I've been noticing almsgiving in the New Testament. It's in the Gospel of Matthew, it's in Mark, it's in Luke. It's all over Paul. Perhaps it's Pope Francis's pontificate that's shedding a greater light on this theme for me. But it's everywhere you look. And I'll be honest, in, my, in the past, I haven't really wanted to think very much about almsgiving. It's just not all that exciting. It's just not all that theologically, um, you know, complex. And yet, the New Testament comes back to it time and time again. I also like, don't like to think about it because it has implications. <laughs> that I am not necessarily all that comfortable with. St. Paul tells the Philippians, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. St. Paul has talked about how they share in the grace of his imprisonment and how they share in his ministry. And certainly they, they do that by union with Christ or communion with Christ that is affected in the Eucharist. But Paul recognizes that they do share in his ministry in a very concrete way. He says he's confident that the good work that God began in them would be brought to completion. Why? What evidence is there for Paul's hope? I would submit to you the answer is found in Philippians 4. And John Bergsman is going to talk about Philippians 4, but I cleared this with him. He's not going to talk about this part of the chapter. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into koinonia, partnership, koinoneo. No church entered into partnership with me in the accounting of giving and receiving, except you only. So only you entered into this accounting. It's a financial term. The RSV obscures it, but the Greek makes it clear. For even in Thessalonica, you know, you've heard of Paul's letters to the Thessalonians. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help once again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit which increases to your credit. Notice Paul is saying, it's not the financial contribution so much that I appreciate. What I really appreciate, what I'm really happy to see what I rejoice in is that you have given me this money and now what has happened it accrues to your credit you have accrued credit you have you have gained credit it 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 is credited to your account he says I have received full payment and more I am filled having received from Aphroditus the gifts you sent a fragrant offering a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And then get this. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So yes, you were once rich. But now you gave of your wealth. And that giving was a, was a clear expression of your sacrificial offering to Christ. You've ever heard, have you ever heard the phrase, put your money where your mouth is? I think that's what Paul is saying. Because it's really easy for us to talk about faith and trust. But the reality hits us when we start applying that to our lives financially. Do we really trust in God or do we trust in our own work? The finances, the money that we have been able to gain through the work of our hands. Do we trust in our work? Do we worship the work of our hands? That's what you call idolatry. Or do we really trust in God? St. Paul is inviting the Philippians to give themselves to Christ in emptying their wallets. Now you might say, well, yeah, but St. Paul is clear, you know, we have to be careful about doing that, but, you know, we don't want to go overboard, you know. That's the way I've always read those passages. Well, yeah, it's good, you know, we, we should give something, you know. A dollar bill, that's good, 
But that's not St. Paul's philosophy. Look at 2 Corinthians 8. St. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 8. We want you to know, brethren, about the grace of God, which has been shown in the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of liberality on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means. Now you can understand this in two ways, as Thomas Aquinas says. They gave according to their means, to their ability. You know, to their human ability to give. But God gave them even greater ability by grace. That's certainly, I think, a proper reading of this. But you can also read this, as Thomas Aquinas says, as pointing out the quantity of their gift. They gave according to what they had, and then even more than what they had of their own free will. Why? They gave more than they actually had the capacity to give. Why? Begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but first they gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Mother Teresa used to talk about the importance of giving till it hurts. Famously, Mother Teresa came to America and was astonished at how poor our country is. Why? Can't you see the skyscrapers? Can't you see all of the wealth in America? No, Mother Teresa had a spiritual perspective. She recognized that true wealth is not what is stored up on earth where the moth and the rust consume. She recognized true wealth is found in heaven. And it's especially linked to almsgiving. And so how did Mother Teresa live her life? Think of the great saints of the church. When we think of great piety and holiness, we think of, in our own day, Mother Teresa. Or we think of St. Francis, where we are today. Francis, Franciscan University. Francis wanted to become a knight, and instead he divested himself of his wealth. Why? So he could gain treasure in heaven. And why does he do this? Because what St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8 is the rationale for all almsgiving, according to St. Paul. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Why do we give alms? It's an expression of our belief in Christ's work of redemption. We owed a debt that we could not pay. And so Christ became poor for our sakes. And so what do we do? Every time we celebrate the Eucharist, we do what ancient Jews did at Passover. We celebrate our redemption. When Jews celebrated Passover, read the Gospel of John, you'll find what did they do at Passover time? They gave money to the poor. Why? Why did they give money to poor Passover? What did God do at the time of Passover? He redeemed them. That's an economic term. He bought them out of slavery. He delivered them out of the debt of their captivity, which ultimately is an image of sin. And so at Passover time, to celebrate this, the Jews would give alms. Remember, Judas leaves the Last Supper early. Why does he leave? The disciples think he's going out to give something to the poor. What do we do in the new Paschal celebration of the Mass? We have the offertory. I think a lot of times we as Catholics look at the offertory as like the intermission. <laughs> All right? Okay, we got through the homily. <laughs> Let me take a minute here to decompress before we get into the next part of the liturgy. But the offertory is not just arbitrarily, you know, inserted into the Mass by the church. The offertory is an integral part of the liturgy. Why? All the way back to the time of St. Paul. The church has been taking up a collection for the poor. 
But there's no better place to do that than in the Eucharistic celebration. Where after uniting ourselves to Christ and to one another, we demonstrate our affection and we demonstrate our recognition of our unity by looking out for the needs of others. If necessary, becoming poor even for others, right? Giving to the point where it hurts. I talked about my hospital experience, rejoicing and suffering. And uh, obviously, I mean, I'm joking. My wife is the one who endured all the suffering. What I experienced was what we call first world problems. <laughs> right? First world problems. They only have Diet Pepsi, not Diet Coke. Right? First world problems. I can't find my favorite candy bar at the gas station. Right? First world problems. I've got a hole in one of my favorite pairs of jeans, right? The air conditioning has gone out. When we look at the world and we look at the suffering in the world and we look at the injustice in the world, these problems are really relatively minor, huh? They're really insignificant at all. They're insignificant in, in the grand scheme of things, I should say. We are called to enter into the suffering of Christ. You know, I hear the gospel and the account of Peter denying Christ. And when Christ uh, is suffering and he's being beaten and tried, where's Peter? He's standing next to a charcoal file warming himself. Now, I know he's suffering, but it's cold out here. You know, I identify with Peter. <laughs> All right. We need to learn to divest of our, ourselves of the creature comforts that we become so familiar with, to detach ourselves from worldly goods. And there's no better way to do that than in almsgiving. So yes, this talk has a theological component, but it also has a practical component as well. And I'll end with this. St. Paul says, the point is this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. In other words, the more we give, the more God will reward us. We can never be more generous with God than he will be with us. And so I want to challenge all of us to think of ways that we can support the church's ministry. And in particular, this weekend, we'll, this week we'll have a great opportunity for almsgiving. They'll be taking up a collection for the mission of Franciscan University. Allow yourselves to really be challenged as they do that and support this great work, as well as your parishes and the poor in your own places as well. Why don't we end here with a prayer, asking the Lord for his grace, his gift, to empower us to be like Christ and lay down our lives in tangible ways. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, in Paul's first letter to Timothy, we read that the love of money is the root of all evils. Help us, Lord, to recognize the seriousness of that temptation. Help us to learn to imitate Christ, who was rich for our sake, became poor. Help us to empty ourselves as he emptied himself, embracing our cross, allowing ourselves to be fragrant offering sacrifices as the Philippians were. Help us, Lord, to give tangible, concrete expression to our faith in the work of redemption so that, as Paul says, we will store up for ourselves a good foundation for the future so that we may take hold of the life, which is life indeed. And we ask this in Jesus' name, and we say, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you so very much. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>